O Jerusalem, Jerusalem, the city that kills the prophets and stones God's messengers. How often I have wanted to gather your children together as a hen protects her chicks beneath her wings. But you wouldn't let me. And now look, your house is left to you empty and desolate. For I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say, bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. As Jesus was leaving the temple grounds, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings, but he told them, do you see all these buildings? I assure you, they will be so completely demolished that not one stone will be left on top of another. Later, Jesus sat on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and asked, When will all this take place? And will there be any sign ahead of time to signal your return and the end of the world? And Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you, for many will come in my name, saying, I am the Messiah. They will lead many astray, and wars will break out near and far, but don't panic. Yes, these things must come, but the end won't follow immediately. The nations and kingdoms will proclaim war against each other, and there will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world. But all of this will be only the beginning of the horrors to come. May God add his blessing to this, his word this morning. Amen. My sermon entitled, Understanding the Second Coming. We live in a very tumultuous world. To some people, the second coming should happen now. If you live in a war-torn country, if you're a child and you're 10 or 12 years old and you've never had a day in your life without hearing gunfire and explosions. And there's lots of children like that now who see horrendous things the children shouldn't necessarily see. But we live in a part of the world where there is peace. But we're all in a conflict wherever we are. I read a magazine called New Scientist. And this particular magazine earlier this year said, Intelligent Evolution. Now to me that's a total contradiction in terms. And the article is, Intelligent Without Design. The introduction is quite interesting, it says. A feather isn't just pretty, it's pretty useful. Strong, light and flexible, with tiny barbs to zip each filament to its neighbours. It is fantastically designed for flight. Sounds good, doesn't it? From an evolutionist. The mammalian eye, too, is a marvel of complex design with its pupil to regulate the amount of light that enters, a lens to, f to focus it onto the retina, and rods and cones for low light and color vision, all linked to the brain through the optic nerve, and these are just the tip of the iceberg of evolution's incredible prowess as a designer. For centuries, the apparent perfection of such design was taken as self-evident proof of a divine creation. 
Charles Darwin himself expressed amazement that natural selection could produce such variety and complexity. Even today, creationism and intelligent design thrive on intuitive incredulity that an unguided, unconscious process could produce such intricate contraptions. We know now that intuition fails us. With feathers, eyes and all living things, the product the products of an entirely natural process. What gobbledygook. Intelligent without design. You've only got to stand here this morning and look at everything in this building. Everything we see, the carpets, the chairs, the ceiling, roof, it's all designed. And this is dead material. And you're not going to get anything in this world unless it's designed by somebody. But then to come out with stuff like this and say it just happens and that's the way it is and there is no God, the only reason they say that is because they don't want a God. And that's all evolution has got to offer. And it tells us, it tells our children, that that's all what life is about. You begin and you end, that's it. We answer the three fundamental questions of life. Where do you come from? And I can't just say Essex. No, where did I come from? The original members of the human race were designed by God. Six, six to 10,000 years ago. That's it. What are you here for? I am here to help my fellow human beings and to help everybody to have a better life and to inform them about the God that I know. And where are we going? We're going to be with Jesus. A few months ago, and I honestly cannot remember whether this experience was a dream or something else. The funny thing was, I was dressed like I am today, actually. But it wasn't... Yeah, it was a different place because Jesus was there. And I felt it was the time after Jesus had come. But I'm sure I won't be standing there in a, in a suit like this. But, you know, why do we look forward to Jesus coming? And it really hit me then. Because I want to be where Jesus is. And there was a tremendous... It's, it's rather inadequate, but words are inadequate to say there was a tremendous feeling of, of contentment and satisfaction and, I don't know, of overwhelming goodness or something like that. Aren't words lousy? <laughs> and I realised, yes, what's going to happen? We will be with Jesus. We have to take what these evolutionary people say seriously. Because our society is overwhelmed by their influence. But we as Christians have to stand 
as the hymn said, and face the foe. They don't understand because they are ignorant. We can't say that to them. We have to be kind and respectful to all people. We have to listen to God's Holy Spirit. How do you know it's the Holy Spirit speaking to you? Well, as we had in Sabbath school, my sheep know my voice. But also, the Holy Spirit will not ask you to harm or insult anybody or to do anything illegal. And certainly not to cause injury to another human being. So, we are looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ to this earth. We hope it's going to be soon. But when? Matthew 24 and 25 with the parables there and Luke 21 are chapters that we can look at. And of course we've got Daniel and Revelation. It is interesting that next year is the 500th anniversary of Luther pinning his... Um, Ooh. His 95 thesis to the church door. It is also um, oh, what is it? It will come to me. My memory's not as good as it used to be. Anyway, the Lutheran Church is in the process at the moment of coming to an understanding with the Roman Catholic Church inasmuch as that they are apologising to the Roman Catholic Church for the insult that Luther brought upon the Catholic Church by causing all the trouble he did. Pardon? They are apologising for being protesters. Yeah. And next year... They are signing the official document of coming together. I don't know how they can. But they've forgotten. We cannot forget our past. Luther was a great one for the book of Daniel and said you cannot understand the Bible without the book of Daniel. Because it explains revelation, or helps to explain it, I should say. So, when is Jesus going to come? It's interesting in our reading this morning, because Jesus in chapter 23 He's really had a real bash at the uh, religious leaders. And this is a few days before his, his crucifixion. And he goes on to them several times. How terrible it will be for you teachers of the religious law and you Pharisees, hypocrites. For you won't let others enter the kingdom of heaven and you won't go in yourselves. Yes, how terrible it will be for you teachers of religious law and you Pharisees. For you cross land and sea to make one convert and then you turn him into twice the son of hell as you yourselves are. And I would say that's some uncompromising language, isn't it? You can tell why they weren't particularly impressed. And then Jesus leaves the temple. And as he leaves, he says, And now look, your house is left to you empty and desolate. 
He's just telling them. God's presence is not in this temple anymore. It is finished. You are finished. Your house is left to you empty and desolate. For I tell you this, you will never see me again until you say, Bless the one who comes in the name of the Lord. A quotation of Psalm 118, verse 26. Yes, I mustn't forget my... Right, I think we've got to go back there. That's right. And as Jesus was leaving the temple, his disciples pointed out to him the various temple buildings. And they were grand, they were big, they were huge. But he told them, do you see all these buildings? I assure you, they will be so completely demolished that not one stone will be left on top of another. Have you got a cup of water that I might have, please? And it says, later, Jesus sat on the slopes of the Mount of Olives. His disciples came to him privately and asked, when will all this take place and will there be any sign ahead of time to signal your return and the end of the world? Do you see all these buildings? Not one stone will be left on the other. The temple was a massive structure, according to Josephus, made of white stone with many gold plates over it. At first sunlight in the morning, it reflected back as a very fiery light which made people who were coming towards it turn away as it appeared as bright as the sun. An exceedingly white building. It was like a mountain covered with snow from a distance. That's what Josephus said in, in his publication, Wars 5.5 and point six. Some of the stones used in the construction of the temple... Thank you very much. Some of the stones used in the construction of the temple were up to 70 feet long. Many were just 36 feet long. But they were 18 feet wide and 12 feet high. You don't push them into place with your knee or anything like that. They weigh many, many tons. And to the disciples, to say not one will be left upon another was a complete no-no. That can't happen. Goodness me, how can you do that? <clears throat> to the disciples, it was an impossible event ever to take place. And if it did take place, it certainly would be a sign to mark the end of the world. But in Jesus' description of these events, he does not seek to explain the idea that the destruction of the temple and the end of the world are two separate events, separated by at least 2,000 years. We do not understand either, as the Bible states of that time, when that would be, but only the Father in heaven. Christians have been hard-pressed to try and disentangle this prophecy. 
Why did Jesus do this? The chapter slowly unfolds the reason. Jesus did not come to tell us when, but to alert us to the idea of living in a state of continual expectancy as we look for his soon return. I don't think actually telling people at that time that the temple event is going to be in AD 70 and Jesus' return won't be for another 2,000 odd years would do a great deal for the people at that time. But as we move down this chapter, it is quite significant. These statements here. Now, four times in Matthew 24, we are given a particular fact. Four times. And if Jesus, in any part of Scripture, tells you something four times, it's important. Verse 36. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. Only the Father knows. Jesus in his human existence did not know. And then a few verses later. So be prepared because you don't know what day your Lord is coming. Two verses later. You must be ready all the time for the Son of Man will come when least expected. Six verses later. Well, the Master will return unannounced and unexpected. It is so positive that in reality, Jesus Christ could come back today. That would surprise us, wouldn't it? We need to have the air of expectancy and the unknown to help us to be stimulated in our mission to tell others. Now, we are now quite convinced that the return of Jesus Christ is going to be in the near future. But we don't know the day, we don't know the hour. And when it does happen, it will completely hit us by surprise. As I said, it is to be so unexpected that it could even happen today. But instead, Jesus gives us quite a list of markers. Am I doing something wrong? Ah, no. There's a little light showing that says it's moving, but it's... Okay. This is good. This is good. And Jesus told them, don't let anyone mislead you. For many will come in my name claiming, I am the Messiah. And you will hear of wars and threats of wars, but don't panic. Yes, these thin things must take place, but the end will not follow immediately. Nation will go to war against nation, and nation against kingdom. There will be famines and earthquakes in many parts of the world, but all this is, the, is only the first of the birth pains with more to come. Jesus gives his disciples a list of events, but in reality it's not very helpful. 
It does not give some much specific detail of the end of the age. There have always been false messiahs, wars, famines and earthquakes. These are not the key events. They have always been. And it says these are natural events with more to come and even worse. Perhaps these could be considered similar to the sign of the rainbow which God gave to remind us of his covenant promise with us that he will not flood the world again. As with Noah's flood, the signs are a clear indication that we live in a fallen world. And the results of living in a fallen world is the devastation and disasters that we see around us. It is evidenced by Earth's sickness. Each of these signs is a promise that Christ will come to complete the saving of his people from their sins. There are three precise signs also in Matthew 24 that we can assess. And the good news about the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations will hear it. And then the end will come. To the disciples, this must have sounded more like another impossibility. The gospel preached throughout the whole world. How come? We're only here in Jerusalem. And perhaps for many centuries, but through the Roman Empire, Christianity spread throughout the then known world. And about 200 years ago, we had the birth of various missions and the Bible Society about, about the same time. And the word has spread further. Now we have satellites covering the world, the internet and the Bible, or parts of it can be read in most all languages. But there are still various dialects and languages, about a hundred of them I understand, that have not yet been covered. And the good news of the kingdom will be preached throughout the whole world so that all nations, it says all nations, it says all peoples. Does it mean everyone? That's another point of discussion, isn't it? Because do people need to, does everybody need to be told? Because the Holy Spirit often speaks to people who have not had any understanding of Christianity. I only had one experience of this when a lady phoned me up and said, I'm not a Christian, she said. But I have an overwhelming desire to worship God. But I don't know if there is a God. Now the Holy Spirit had spoken to her. No human being had. So the Holy Spirit does speak to people. He speaks to everyone. Well, it says in Revelation 3.20, doesn't it? Behold, I stand at the door and knock. And if anybody hears my voice and opens the door, anybody, it says, not anybody who knows me, but if anybody opens that door and asks me in, I will come in and fellowship with him. There are seven billion people in this world. Are we going to get to everyone? Well, I suppose that is possible with today's technology. But the Holy Spirit speaks first. The Holy Spirit moves people to respond. So has the Bible's message got to everybody? Interesting thought.
The second sign is not something to predict the event, but actually tells us that when this happens, it's already started. For as the lightning flashes in the east and shines to the west, so it will be when the Son of Man comes. The lightning from east to west tells us that it's happening. It doesn't tell us that the coming is near, but that it's taking place now. When is that going to be? Everyone will see it. That is the thing. Nobody will not see it. The next sign is in verse 29, which tells us that the coming of Jesus is near. We have said as Adventists that these signs took place over a period beginning nearly 200 years ago. But some also believe that these signs will be repeated again just before Jesus actually does come back. Immediately after the anguish of those days, the sun will be darkened, the moon will give no light, the stars will fall from the sky, and the powers in the heavens will be shaken. Again, it's a little bit hazy, but we still believe in the message that's been spread over the last 200 years. The time of Jesus' return is indeed very close. Then we move to the next verse. And then, at last, the sign that the Son of Man is coming will appear in the heavens. And there will be deep mourning among all the peoples of the earth. And they will see the Son of Man coming on the clouds of heaven with power and great glory. The sign of the Son of Man will appear in the heavens. And there will be deep mourning. Who's doing the mourning? Those who don't want Jesus to come. Similar to the people who danced around the ark when they were shut in the ark. It seems to indicate that the majority of people on the earth will not be looking forward to the return of Jesus Christ. And the deep mourning amongst the peoples of the earth who rejected Jesus as their saviour. When you think of that, wouldn't that be a horrendous situation to be in? I trust it will not apply to any of us here or to those we love and cherish. Our family and friends particularly. How important it is to realise that Jesus is coming again soon. I'm in a very similar situation, a more real situation with regard to that because my brother at the moment is close to death. I'm going to see him this afternoon. He's in hospital in Essex. I want him to wake up and open his eyes when Jesus comes and to be there.
And I'm sure we have many loved ones who don't necessarily respond to Jesus Christ, who we also would like to be there. The invitation is open to everyone. Seven billion people in this world have got the invitation. Many of them don't know there is an invitation yet. And when the angels come, it says in verse 31, and he will send out his angels with the mighty blast of a trumpet, and they will gather his chosen ones from all over the world, from the farthest ends of the earth and heaven. I've got the message translation here as well, which I find is quite, quite interesting. Then the arrival of the Son of Man, it will fill the skies. No one will miss it. That's fantastic, isn't it? No one will miss it. Unready people all over the world, outsiders to the splendor and power, will raise a huge lament as they watch the Son of Man blazing out of heaven. At that same moment, he'll dispatch his angels with a trumpet blast, summoning, pulling in God's chosen from the four winds, from pole to pole. Can you imagine that? But the invitation is open to all the seven billion people in this world today. It's a very simple invitation. John 17.3 is one of my favourite short passages. And this is the way to have eternal life. To pay my tithe regularly to observe the Sabbath. To observe all the Ten Commandments. Every day. No. It doesn't say that. And this is the way to have eternal life. To know you. The only true God. And Jesus Christ the one you sent to the earth. To know. People need an introduction. God is trying to introduce them through the power of the Holy Spirit. Speaking to every human being in this world every day. With the knock on their heart doors. Everybody in this world every day is getting a, that little knock. But they're not listening. Because there's such a, a fog out there of noise that they don't pick up the, tru the sound of truth. That's often where we come in. And the most important thing for us as Christians to be is Christian. In the morning watch this week, Ellen, uh, uh, the watch that, for this year that's written by Ellen White, she was going through and saying how we should be as Christians. And she said, if only, if only we were. I'm not saying that to say, be like me, because I'm not always very happy with how like me is. I wish I more closely resembled Jesus Christ in my life than I do. Because that is our task in this world, to be the people we say we are. Sometimes we despise other people and we should never do that. Whatever things other people do, I always remember that saying, there but for the grace of God that could be me. 
whether it's murder or robbery or whatever, because at different stages in life, people take different directions and they have horrendous consequences. I'm just pleased that I haven't gone down those roads. But it could have been me. And I hope to God that it will never will be me. But we need to stay close to Jesus Christ. Our saviour and our friend. And then in Mark 12 and verse 28. This is just the basic thoughts on Christianity that I'm just going over here. One of the teachers of religious law was standing there listening to the debate. He realised that Jesus had answered well, so he asked, Of all the commandments, which is the most important? The Jews always wanted to know which is the most important. They couldn't get the idea that every commandment is very important. There is not necessarily one that is more important than everybody else because they're all collective in the expression of what is God's commandments. And Jesus replied, the most important commandment is this. Listen, O Israel, the Lord our God is the one and only Lord, and you must love the Lord your God with all your heart, all your soul, all your mind, and all your strength. And then Jesus says, and the second is, you can't just have one commandment. The second is equally important. Love your neighbour as yourself. No other commandment is greater than these. And to the people of Isis, supposedly serving the true God, where do they get beheading people in loving your neighbour? as yourself where do they get abusing women or abusing children or abusing anybody else from love your neighbour as yourself it's impossible they are servants of the devil They cannot represent God behaving like that. Just to emphasise with that message translation, then the arrival of the Son of Man, it will fill the skies, no one will miss it, Unready people all over the world, outsiders to the splendour and power, will raise a huge lament as they watch the Son of Man blazing out of heaven. Can you imagine that? What a powerful concept that will be. If we're on this earth at that time and looking up and see that event coming before our eyes... See the Son of Man blazing out of heaven as he comes to this earth. And at that same moment, he'll dispatch his angels with a trumpet blast summons, pulling in God's chosen from the four winds, from pole to pole. And I'm sorry for being re repetitive. However, no one knows the day or the hour when these things will happen. Not even the angels in heaven or the Son himself. 